So welcome everyone. Tonight's alumni speaker series is Cybersecurity 101 with Charles Barley. I am Becky Toth, AVP for Advancement and a member of SU's class of 1992. We will have time for questions following the presentation and we will do our best to get to all of them, including those that you submitted ahead of time. During the, pre during the presentation, you may submit questions in the Q&A feature Tonight's presentation is also being recorded. I want to acknowledge a few SU faculty and staff who are in attendance. We have Vice President for Advancement, Melissa Kamora, members of the Alumni Relations Team, Jody Swartz and Logan Sweet, and we welcome from the Board of Trustees, Don Hamlin, Lois Martin, and Tony Tomarazzo. To introduce Charles and to serve as our moderator, we welcome Jenna Gentinen, a senior at SU majoring in computer science. Jenna is also a thrower on the track and field team and a member of the Sigma Kappa sorority. After graduation, she plans on working as a business analyst for Everest Insurance and Reinsurance Company. I'll turn it over to you, Jenna. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to begin by introducing our speaker, Charles Barley Jr. He graduated from Susquehanna University with a Bachelor's of Science degree in accounting in 1999. Currently, Charles is RSM's East Market Growth Leader of the Security and Price Risk Solution. He also serves as a cybersecurity government contractor industry champion. Charles has led a number of CMMC cybersecurity maturity model cert certification readiness initiatives and security transformation agendas, in addition to data protection and assets and policy development engagements, which focus on cybersecurity governance, I'm sorry, security governments, data pri um, pricey, information classification, and overall data protection programs for the data rich organizations. In his career, he has had 22 years of consulting experience and has served several multinational government contracting um, organizations and public sector institutions. While advising several government contractors, he helped with the design and implementation um, of their information security posture and corresponding IT risk management programs. Prior to RSM, Charles served as the global director of IT audit with the global organization, where he was um, responsible for establishing and leading the global IT risk and audit function for the organization and supporting the initial public offering and Sarbanes-Oxley readiness and implementation activities. Lastly, Charles recently served as the national leader of RSM's African-American Employee Network Group, where he was responsible for defining and implementing the overall strategy in line with the firm's culture, diversity, and inclusion program. Hello, Charles. Hello, Jenna. Sorry for all the <laughs> um, alphabet soup and acronyms there. <laughs> um, so I just wanna start with how you got into the field of cybersecurity from graduating Susquehanna with a degree in accounting? Man, that's a great question. So, you know, when you said 1999, I had to think, geez, am I that old that it was, <laughs> you know, pre-2000? Um, you know, what's interesting, when, when I started the process of even evaluating colleges and universities, I wanted a career or a, an institution that would give me not only the business acumen, that we of course get as an accounting major and those seeking a CPA, but I also wanted to minor uh, in information systems because let's face it, even way back in the dark ages, uh, pre 2000, we knew that computers would be big and literally they were bigger uh, than these lovely handheld devices or, or wristwatches that we wear today. And so I just had an opportunity uh, at that time to bring two diverse uh, disciplines together that allowed me to of course learn the business and accounting and finance uh, lexicon, but then more importantly, be prepared for where we are today and where we're, we're going as it relates to technology and information systems. Good, um, and if you can share, what are some key projects that you are working on right now in your position? Good question. So um, obviously I have to be a little bit careful uh, in terms of, of what, I, what I say, but um, one of the major things that, that I have the fortunate uh, opportunity to do, as I tell most of my kids, they, they tend to think I'm a part of this, you know, Intel world or black ops space where I don't talk too much about what I do, but 
the fun thing I get to say is most of my clients, when they listen to me, they never end up on the front page of the Washington Post or New York Times or whatever the, the uh, record of uh, newspaper of choice is. Uh, but specifically, I probably spend the majority of, of my time in two different communities. The, the first and largest community is, uh, as, as you rightly captured in, in my bio there, was what is referred to as the government contracting community. And that's just a big word for uh, commercial organizations who provide goods and services to many, many parts of the federal government. So while my client is not the federal government, it's the commercial entities. So most organizations, uh, most uh, individuals know companies or have heard of companies like um, uh, Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman or Boeing where the US government never really creates anything and they go out and procure everything. So the Department of Defense specifically may need to uh, arm our troops with the latest and greatest weapon systems. And so they contract out to organizations like Lockheed and Boeing. Well, I support those entities to make sure that their intellectual property, that their uh, use and possession of the government's data is secure from the adversary. That's the best way I can define it. Uh, and that is everything from defining the cybersecurity risk management posture to uh, responding to breaches and data loss when that occurs, cyber threat intelligence reviews to basically understand what the adversary already has, and in some other uh, unique instances, breaking into systems to really help them understand the weaknesses uh, through penetration testing. And so that's the real cool stuff where we get to act like a bad guy and use nefarious techniques. So that's where I spend most of my time. And then the other side of the coin is consulting to uh, Fortune 100 companies who also have a need uh, for uh, improving their cybersecurity posture. And so Fortune 100 uh, is what you would imagine. It's the biggest companies in the world. And so I had the, the fortunate opportunity to be what we call a road warrior. Uh, jumping on airplanes and helping companies that if you, you know, name them like Walmarts, the Amazons, the big names that you would expect, uh, we have the fun uh, and exciting time to help them as well. Uh, what are your biggest challenges today? And that has, going along with that question, um, in the past years, obviously we've experienced the pandemic. Has COVID affected your day-to-day -day work at all? <laughs> biggest challenges my wife would say <laughs> listening to her but no <laughs> my, biggest, my biggest work related challenge so you know this I'll tie the two together this year the last you know 18 to 24 months has been a stressful learning opportunity for the entire world and the consulting environment and the corporate environment has not been immune to that so what do I mean by that? Uh, like every corp, uh, environment or every company, we've all had our struggles to retain talent because as we've gone virtual, most of organizations were used to being brick and mortar, physically going to the same place every day or just grinding it out and working through whatever the day's tasks are. Well, when we all went virtual, that gave every uh, individual an opportunity to rethink life and ask the question, do I want to stay in this particular profession, whatever that was, uh, for a period of time? And so that, that term, that phrase, or this time was dubbed the great resignation. And so companies of all shapes and sizes had to deal with the migration of personnel. And so we weren't immune to that, uh, even though we get to do some pretty cool things. And for consulting, it's kind of like dog years, meaning you have an opportunity to work on a myriad of companies and industries in a very short period of time where when you're in a, a different organization, perhaps it's just that organization's posture. And so the ability to retain uh, qualified cybersecurity talent is a um, phenomenal opportunity for us to overcome these days. Uh, and our clients are in the same place. You know, this has probably been one of the busiest time times I've had in my 22, 23 years, because even though we had some challenges, just being honest, our clients' challenges were greater and they lost talent to the point where uh, all of our different uh, consulting service lines have had an increase uh, in opportunities to support because our clients have such needs. And so the other part of your question, the pandemic, um, it's been interesting because if you're used to being 
out of the house every single day as I have for the past 20 plus years while I have absolutely enjoyed being at home, being a parent uh, to a greater extent than I've ever had the opportunity before because I was always gone supporting the needs of our family and our clients, but now I get to be home every day. And so that took some time getting used to uh, because I'm used to being out of the house. And let's face it, my wife also took some time getting used to me being home every day and bothering her like crazy. Um, but we all adjust. And, and I don't know that there'll ever be uh, this thing called normal ever again. I think we'll all be in some variation of a hybrid work environment that has some part of the workforce in person and some part of the workforce uh, doing what we're doing right now, just using a computer and being connected. Did uh, the cybersecurity threat rise that COVID happened or is it still stationary where it was before? Oh, God, no. So w whenever there is a world epidemic or uh, some particular national disaster or uh, let's face it, what we're seeing um, with Russia and Ukraine, the, the adversary uses our weaknesses against us. They use every opportunity to exploit our humanity uh, and err on the side of, well, you won't pay attention to a particular minute detail because it's a particular time of the year. One of the greatest things that happens uh, in the month of April, and so as a accounting major, most folks understand that in the month of April, that's when we typically all file our taxes. And one of the greatest things that the adversary, the threat, those people trying to exploit different threat vectors will do is what we call social engineering activities and literally have the ability to create uh, various uh, touch points that look as authentic as you would imagine. So I have the ability right now to create an email that looks like it's coming from the secretary of um, the, the IRS. And if a unsuspecting individual doesn't pay attention to the minute details because it's the April timeframe, <clears throat> excuse me, they may inadvertently provide um, credentials that allow me to exploit or allow an adversary to exploit their weaknesses in their human um, frailty, right? And so the same thing exists with COVID. We were all rushing, for example, to be properly protected, vaccinated, et cetera. And so the adversary found ways to continually uh, exploit that through creating fictitious websites that we all thought were places to sign up for different health checks. And when you did that, you started to provide very sensitive information, your social security number, your medical records, your name and address. And so that's very rich information that can be monetized in some dark places on the web. And so we absolutely saw an increase uh, in clients of varying industries. And right now, even over the last, unfortunately, uh, two to 14, um, two, two, 10 to 14 days, We've seen an increase in a number of our clients, both international and, and, and domestic, uh, beginning to be explo exploited from uh, rise in oil prices to um, impersonating uh, different buyers and sellers in the market to uh, simply a rise in credit card charges that you just didn't understand would happen. And so gone are the days of little you know, emails that uh, we all used to receive that, hey, I'm this individual from some country, you know, afar off, and I have this kid that I want you to sponsor. Those those types of nefarious attempts still exist, but they're a little bit more sophisticated now, and they're all designed to exploit the weaknesses in our human frailty uh, that allow us to gain uh, different key data points that we can exploit to gain access to the keys to the kingdom. Um, and then for business owners and business leaders, kind of going into that realm now, um, what do you think companies as a whole need to know about cybersecurity to keep themselves safe? Yeah, so great question. So one of the, the great things is, as I mentioned, we have the opportunity to help clients of varying sizes. So it's organizations that are uh, as small as $10 million in market cap to as large as $24 billion in, in, in market cap. And so what I tell every organization and even small business owners uh, is, <coughs> excuse me, regardless of your size, you could be a target. Um, it, it's not necessarily 
what you have, it's sometimes who you have a connection to. That is the ultimate goal behind some of the different uh, threat vectors that get exploited. And so the first thing that I tell every uh, individual business owner is to just be aware, be vigilant in terms of your ability to properly protect the things you care about. For example, every day, I assume most folks on this call go home and they unlock a door and then they lock a door. Uh, and then they make sure that their windows and their garage door, and if they have an alarm system, they go through different steps before they ultimately sit down and call in the night. Well, the same thing exists when you start to use technology, you must make sure that the information systems, the computers, the laptops, uh, even the cloud-based services that you utilize, that they are first and foremost using the latest and greatest uh, versions of the available software. Because if it is an antiquated platform, well, know that those antiquated platforms are no longer supported and they're not patched to the level of something that is new and, and, and maintained. The second thing that even though you may have the, the best and greatest and available technology, well, you must go through a series of activities to continually harden, uh, increase the security posture, to tighten uh, and eliminate services that you don't need. So that's something key that most companies sometimes overlook. They assume because they have the best version of uh, Platform X, you know, Windows 11 or whatever the case may be, that it's just secure by design. And while that may be true, it's not secure on a daily basis. And so threats are always identified and you must stay ahead of those. And then the last one is just continuously monitor uh, that after you have deployed the best technology, after you have hardened those platforms, then you must continuously monitor just like you walk around your house or you may have an ADT system uh, whereby, uh, ADP, uh, ADT, that's a, the, the right one, um, that they ultimately monitor who's coming or leaving your property. And so that is a, the same fact exists uh, from a cybersecurity perspective that you must often knock on your door and see where the softness exists in your perimeter because the moment you get lax, that's where a data breach uh, or an exploit gets realized. Good. And then um, when it comes to cybersecurity, um, you talked about kind of being weary of emails and sites you put your information in. Uh, what do you think it's most important for folks to consider with the cybersecurity front? <laughs> the, thing, the thing that comes to mind is trust no one. It, it, it sounds kind of paranoid a little bit, but but seriously, I mean, think about it, right? Just because the two of us uh, have a relationship now, you don't know tomorrow if I'm impersonating uh, Becky. I can generate an email and you're trusting because you see an email that says, you know, Becky from Susquehanna University. Well, there's trust with verification. And so it is often preached but rarely is it practiced uh, because we are trusting by nature. And that's the thing that as a security professional, we look for uh, kinks in the armor through whom you've trusted because you right now, I am also using a personal laptop. And while you may not be my end goal, because you and I have a relationship, you now trust me in the connection that I have via Zoom. But if I can send a nefarious email over to you with an attachment that you then click on, that attachment then explodes a payload that gives me access to your computer that then gives me access to the administrative and financial records of the entire university. And so that's why I say, you know, trust no one, but verify everything. Because while individually uh, we may not be the ultimate target, but we are, you know, um, the sum of our parts. And so together, perhaps there is a a vehicle that we ultimately want to exploit through the relationships that we all have. Um, without going into how you can get into my computer, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, what do you think the average person can do to keep themselves safe in the cybersecurity front on their computer and stuff like that? Yeah, like what so is the best steps forward for that not happening. Sure. So it's it's funny you ask the question. So um, I'm fortunate enough to to get to to speak around the world, and and there was a recent conference for uh, the Global AICPA uh, organization here in the DC area, and, and I remember 
um, and you had some of the biggest companies in the world, CEOs, CFOs, et cetera, and we were on the main stage. And so one of the things we did was set up a, um, what's referred to as a pineapple. Uh, it's a rogue access point. So you guys, everyone knows wireless access. We all use it every single day. But the question is, do you pause to actually think, are you connecting to whom you think you're connecting to? For example, all of us at some point may go to a hotel uh, or Starbucks or even a public library. And so when you do that, you see this fun thing that says free access, free Wi-Fi access. And so how many of you actually verify who you're connecting to before you connect and begin to use their wireless access? Now you may say, well, that's okay because I use a VPN. While that's true, a VPN doesn't protect your asset. It protects what goes across the wire. And so at this particular conference, we set up a rogue access point in a pineapple, which uh, allowed us to impersonate this particular global uh, hotel brand. And while we went through this exercise, major uh, individuals in the room, CEOs and the likes, began to connect to our wireless access point, our rogue device. And during the middle of my presentation, I started to point out that, hey, CEO from you know, corporatecompany.com, I see you just tried to purchase this you know, airline ticket and here are the last four digits of your credit card. Or, hey, John, in the front row, I see that you just submitted your income tax return and I have your social security number. Here it is, of course, with the, you know, the digits blocked out. And that was all because they trusted what appeared to be hotel.com. And, and so I tell everyone, don't, don't, um, uh, don't be so trusting and use what is easily provided to you. Those things that are easy are not meant to be fair and fun. And so I tell all of my kids, you know, uh, and, and, and family members and clients alike, never use any free service. Uh, it is the worst thing you can possibly do. The other thing, it's really fun, telecomatic. So if you're familiar with all the different cars that exist, you know, Tesla, all, all the autonomous drivers, well, most of the cars that were built after 2015, or really 2012, they all have what? A USB device inside that car. And so you think it's there for fun, and it is. It is there to enable you to ultimately recharge your phone or play your fun music, you know, from Apple Music, you know, on the surround sound speakers. But at the same time, every time you connect to that USB device in that car or in the airport or in the library, that makes a connection to your device. And when that connection is made, there's potentially a copy of your phone and all the information that is exported from uh, that device, device, depending on what's on the other side. And so again, that's another example of a free service that you never ever should use, unless you have what's called a data blocker that sits between you uh, and that um, device. But usually folks don't carry that. You just want what's free and easy. Do you have any recommendations for data blockers for the audience to look into or use? Yeah, so I mean, you can get data blockers, you can go to Walmart, you can go to Amazon. I mean, any of our retail, retail stores today, if you just simply type in data blocker, it is a very simple USB device that limits the connection from the USB port to your end device and limits the transfer of information. So there's tons of different uh, entities that create those today, but definitely use them. It will save you from uh, inadvertently divulging the things you care about the most. Okay. Um, we also had an audience question about um, Norton and McPhee. Uh, so what do you think about personal protection systems like Norton and McPhee, M McAfee? Yeah, Norton and McAfee are great. I mean, the moment you have a personal device or a corporate device, after you have ensured those three things that we talked about, the making sure you have the latest and greatest software that you patched, in between patching and continuous monitoring is the use of uh, personal firewalls and or virus protection uh, systems like Norton and McAfee. And so those are definitely a part of the first line of defense to ensure that you are not allowing different um, weaknesses in your uh, um, uh, assets, your uh, laptops and, and computers to be exploited, uh, whereby different viruses or you've heard, you know, I'm sure you've all heard things like malware or ransomware or all these new fun 
uh, buzzwords that uh, are, are basically used to scare us uh, into never using computers ever again. Uh, but these things are real, right? And so some of the more sophisticated virus protection softwares like Norton and McAfee and there are tons of others are designed to catch those known signatures before they have an opportunity to uh, wreak havoc uh, on your computer systems. And then we also had a question about the autom automotive industry. Um, any thoughts or suggestions for automotive industry? Since vehicles these days are kind of computers on wheels, and then what about for the consumers themselves? Yeah, so I mean, you know, to the point that I mentioned, and sorry if you are a uh, <laughs> a sole proprietor of a of an automotive uh, company, but it, it's a it's a real thing. I mean, think about it. Every single time you plug into a computer uh, to a uh, all of these newer cars, what's really happening to enable you to charge your device or play your your fun music or be on a phone call? And so the best thing I would tell you to do, you still provide those services, uh, but as a car um, uh, dealership, you can, of course, make your uh, buyers aware. Now, if it is a personal car, not a big deal. It's probably just you and, you know, maybe your uh, relatives who are using your vehicle. But if it's a rental car, and that's where the trick is, if it's a rental car, how many folks have had the opportunity to... Um, mess with the protections that are behind the scenes of that USB port. And so the other thing I would tell you, as a dealership, if you are a single location or multiple locations, one of the things you need to ensure that you, you uh, properly do is enable your workforce to be protected and also limit how they disclose the personal information of your buyers. Uh, there's this uh, fun thing called the uh, PCI, the payment card industry. And so all of us on this call probably have one of two things, a debit card or a credit card. Well, when you go into certain establishments like a dealership to pay for your vehicle, your insurance, your registration fees, you provide your card and that card is sometimes, the number is sometimes written down. Even in the year 2022, someone manually writes down your credit card number, expiration date and the likes. And so what happens when that piece of paper leaves your hands and that individual's hands, who has access to it. So I would tell you as an owner, limit that practice immediately. Never, ever again, write down credit cards or even username and passwords, things that you care about. Uh, I tell folks, would you allow me to have your password to your bank account? The answer is probably not. While you might trust me, what would I do with the information once I actually gained access to it? So writing down credit cards and passwords, same thing. You wanna protect that and make sure your workforce is properly aware of the part they play uh, in the securing, securing of the confidential information of the company and more so the consumers who are purchasing from you. On a protection standpoint, so in the recent years, there's come to be Apple Pay and Google Pay and that type of stuff where you have your card on your phone. Do you think that's a safe route to go or how to keep that? How do you keep that protected away from cybersecurity? <laughs> yeah, so I have to be careful, careful because some of those are clients. So <laughs> <laughs> ah, my mother a lot, my mother and I, who she's a phenomenal woman. She's a just a recently retired 35 year computer programmer. So if anyone knows the ins and outs of a computer, <laughs> you would assume it's someone who spent 35 years. And she asked me a question about um, a particular uh, cash-based application on your phone. So you can put the two words together and figure out who I'm talking about. Um, and that particular um, provider is off. It's easy to use because we can all have, you know, hashtag or dollar sign, you know, Charles Barley, right? Here's a way to fund me. But that particular uh, company has some weaknesses in the way they properly protect the individuals who use those those applications. And so the best thing I say, use the bigger name brand entities because they usually have the have devoted the most funding to the cybersecurity professionals within the organization. Uh, I personally I love the Apple ecosystem. While I'm not endorsing them, I can simply tell you the way their technology and algorithms uh, obfuscate the credit card 
the EMV number behind the scene, which is the ultimate, um, the best way to explain that is the uh, digitized version of your credit card and the way the number changes from one transaction to the next. So while the credit cards or debit cards that we have today are static in the numbers, when you put them behind in some of these platforms like Apple and others, the way the credit card number more or less changes from one transaction to the next properly protects you. So the bigger the platform, the better, even if you are, are sometimes on the fence between Google versus Apple and, and the likes, the bigger, the better. They've usually done the right things to protect you. Yeah, absolutely. And then what are the biggest threats in the world right now for cybersecurity on the broad stand front and the small? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, the biggest I would tell you is probably the ability to enable the entire workforce, workforce, employees, contractors, subcontracts, et cetera, to understand the part they have to play in the protection of information. That is probably and always will be top three uh, security uh, weaknesses in organizations uh, because we are trusting by nature and if I call you and say, hi, I'm Charles Barley calling from the Susquehanna University IT help desk, I need you to share your username with you. Well, by default, if I found your number and know that you're on campus, you are a little bit more trusting to divulge information. And so exploiting the human factor and that trust in nature is, is probably number one. Uh, after that, I would probably say shifting responsibilities to other organizations. So. We live in a world where it's okay if you don't have the best IT uh, minds within your organization. You can outsource responsibilities to someone else, and that's a great practice. But when you do that, you need to make sure that before you shift responsibility to a third party, that that third party, first and foremost, aligns with your security practices, and then they themselves have phenomenal security practices where they can protect your information and all the many, many other customers that they are um, commingling your data with. And so there are tons of different platforms from the Google Docs to the Dropboxes, the Box.coms, the Amazon Web Services, et cetera. And they're all reputable companies, but that's just an example of a cloud-based provider. But there are other things that you shift responsibilities to, like managing your payroll, uh, like managing your background checks or the janitorial services uh, who come comes and goes in your building to simply keep all the different uh, common areas clean. So you need to understand how to trust those third parties, but also embed and verify your alignment, their alignment with your security expectations on a regular basis. Otherwise, the people you trust the most that you've shifted responsibility to may be the greatest uh, weakness in your uh, security armor. Absolutely. Those are probably the biggest then, two. Yeah. And then what are the biggest threats for someone like your average person, not in a business? Yeah, you, the average person uh, being overly excited to use a fun app or service that's provided to you. Um, the one thing I tell um, my, my kids, my family uh, all the time is just make sure you understand who you're sharing your personal information with. Just because uh, someone told you on TikTok that here's the best way to, you know, make cupcakes at home while it's fun and it's cute and you can do a fun dance. What did you have to actually just divulge to TikTok or to the individual in order to get the fun recipe of choice, right? And so just be, be protective of how you share. Now, I know, you know, we, we are in a different time where the age of information and the speed at which we share is key. And it is. But there's a way to share things properly and securely without just allowing all of your personal info to just be uh, shared in the wild. Again, if, if, if you were in that particular conference that I mentioned and I had uh, the ability to show you how easy it is to gain access to your personal information because I provided you with what you thought was free internet service. You just need to be more vigilant about whom you uh, connect with. Absolutely. 
And then um, for someone that's trying to get step into the IT cybersecurity space, what do you think the best way to learn about all of this on your own is? Yeah, just being, you know, being hungry for information. I mean, there are so many free sites that exist uh, today that allow you to either be broad and just understand cybersecurity and what it means. And if you want to go deep into a particular industry, vertical, healthcare, financial, uh, federal government, Department of Defense, whatever the case may be, there are different sources of information that you can avail yourself to, but it's all about being personally hungry to go out and find it. Now, you can absolutely go to a class and take a course. There are tons of them that exist today, but um, most of those courses tend to be static, but technology is ever changing. And so how do you stay up to speed uh, on those changes and being uh, agile enough to pivot when the environment and the IT community shifts as well? So the best thing I would tell you is just be hungry for the information and often chasing it and never being complacent with what you thought you understood today because tomorrow something's gonna to be different. Absolutely, being a computer science major, it's always changing. <laughs> um, and then at this moment, I'm gonna start going to the Q&A questions. Um, I'm gonna start with the one about Apple computers because we had two similar. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the best protection for Apple computers? Um, is it pretty good to go with the regular updates with themselves? Uh, yeah, so I'm smiling. <laughs> Because my one of my relatives tells my um, our family members that I work for Geek Squad, so I'm often, you know, shared for these, you know, personal personal computer type of things. So yes, uh, all of the uh, manufacturers like Apple, Windows, etc., they all have pretty phenomenal developers behind the scenes. They understand their weaknesses sometimes before they uh, tell us or. They often hire third-party security professionals to assess and, and break in and find their weaknesses. So when they release those patches, it is a very good thing to, in time, update your system. And I say in time because just because version 1.0 of a particular update comes out, perhaps that update came out too quickly and, and is a little bit buggy. So perhaps you want to wait for version 2 of that update before you deploy it. But the point is that you are aware of the risk when you choose not to upload the patches and you accept that risk or you have a process by which you mitigate that risk going forward. So definitely uh, all of those systems are okay to use the uh, manufacturer provided uh, patching. And then the other question similar to that was, do you think MacBook users need a pre like a paid program like Norton? Uh, or Apple Macs and iPhones, are they safe okay with their own security programs? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the moment you open a computer, laptop, uh, mobile device, they all have an opportunity to be exploited by some uh, uh, knowledgeable individual. And so uh, they all have their weaknesses, even the self-contained ones that uh, they don't share their code with anyone like an Apple, right? Um, but uh, there's always secondary, there's a term in our, a community where we say defense in depth, uh, just like a house, you can have the ability to uh, prevent an issue, correct an issue or detect an issue. And so you need to have different layers of security that align to each of those three different points. And then that same person asks, uh, this bump back to the vehicle questions. Uh, do you think there will be a day when hackers can control vehicles um, when you're driving it and lose control of the steering? Will the hacker be able to control your car eventually? <laughs> I think that day is already here. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, it's a computer. And, and obviously, it takes a very skilled individual to uh, circumvent some of those controls. Uh, have I seen someone hijack um, a car while you're driving a Tesla in the road today? No, but uh, I would tell you if you Google right now uh, some of the different issues that Tesla and all the autonomous drivers and vehicles have, you will absolutely see different exploits that exist right now. Yeah, they're scary. Um, <laughs> can you, uh, next question, can you talk about app permissions with the services connecting with your other information? App permission. So I, th so I think like the question is, oh, go ahead. I was say, so when you're using your phone and you have to um, approve them to get data off your phone. Yes. Yeah, so um, no different than when you go to a networking event 
and you exchange information with someone you're interested in connecting with. The app permissions when you download or install something on a mobile device, a Fire Stick or whatever the, the device of choice is, that application is asking for elevated rights in order to read, write, uh, read or write to your particular hard drive. And so before you say yes, you need to make sure that you're okay with that. There, there are reasons why they need to do that. There are reasons why in order for that application to operate properly and fully install, it needs certain permissions for that instance in order to enable the functionality that you've, you've uh, purchased. Um, and so it's, it's okay, provided you know whom you purchase from. And then next question is, has your job changed or evolved as more and more business data moves from traditional on-premise systems to cloud-based services, um, even in the Department of Defense? And if so, how? <laughs> I thought you were gonna ask, has my job changed me? <laughs> it's made me less trusting. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, to, to my point about staying agile with technologies, so a number of our, my clients in the dark ages back in the early 2000s, they were all using um, on-premise technology, things that were maintained in their four walls and the ability to protect the stuff that is in their house, so to speak, was easy. I can see it. We prop, our teams understood how to assess it. Um, but as organizations shift responsibility to cloud providers, those different cloud providers um, are expected to align to a common security framework, but not all of them do. Uh, those entities that want to work in uh, uh, national security, for example, they're all required to align to a couple of different security standards in order to even play in that space. And so uh, definitely evolving to the expectations of a given industry uh, are key and, and something that we and, and I personally uh, have to stay up on because um, it's just the nature of of our uh, technology environment. Things change by the minute. Absolutely. Um, how has the broader application of artificial intelligence learning models and services challenge IP and data retention requirements? Oh man, that's a great one. So <laughs> yeah. all the stuff we're talking about right now is, is manually performed by an individual, a human on my team or personally, right? So imagine if company X, Acme Inc, asked uh, my firm to come in and perform a penetration test. We deploy a single individual or a set of individuals. But imagine if I had uh, AI or machine learning that allowed me to create a thousand different digital workers all working autonomously to exploit a given environment and it's all executed by a click of a button from my laptop, and off I go to exploit a company with a thousand digital workers. Well, think about that for a second. The ability and the scale and the efficiencies gained, um, the ability to um, execute with a more agile workforce, it, it's just mind blowing. And so some of the more routine tasks are being automated by machine learning or bots um, to the point where there will be certain tasks that are no longer handled by a human. You know, think about it, uh, how we upload contracts today. When you apply to Susquehanna University in the dark ages, you actually manually typed someone, took that application and uploaded it to um, uh, the registrar's environment. Well. Now all of that's digital and no one really has to actually read your application anymore. I'm sure they do because we are one of the best institutions in the world. So of course we want to understand who we're letting into, into our uh, phenomenal campus. But the point is the AI learning has the ability to make some early decisions if you deploy it, where it has the ability to read an application and make decisions well before an actual human in the registrar's office ever receives uh, the um, uh, applications. Do you think there's gonna be, there's gonna come a point that AI is majority of cybersecurity jobs or do you think the, the need for people is gonna stay in cybersecurity? 
<laughs> yeah, that that's the Terminator. Um, you know, all <laughs> these different movies where where the the robots have taken over. Um, you know, I, I think there's definitely a point where there's a convergence of humans and technology, um, where there will always need to be someone who holds the master key to uh, the application. But if you look at every single operational environment today, I mean, look at FedEx, you know, where FedEx started 45, 60 years ago, and the operation systems behind the scenes uh, were people manually moving boxes. Well, now these are gigantic, huge warehouses with robots that are uh, shifting and moving and loading airplanes. Similarly, back in the dark ages when cars were being made, there were people that were manually, even if it were made in America, these cars were being manually molded and painted by individuals. Well, if you look at most of these uh, huge manufacturing plants today, there are robots that have been enabled to perform some of these more routine tasks. And then they're quality checked by other robots. Think about that for a second, a robot checking another robot's work, right? And so these things are real that are happening. And, and obviously we need to stay in front of evolving technology, uh, but there will be tasks that uh, over time uh, get replaced uh, through efficiencies and automation. And then we have time for a few more questions. So if anyone has any left questions left, you can submit them. We just got one. Um, has the broader shift to cloud services forced you to personally seed control to newer cloud-based security models that use data patterns to theoretically increase security. For example, those that can help with detection of compromised systems by leveraging larger data sets of systems or by providing better monitoring. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's being asked by a, a security professional. And so <laughs> I, I, think, I think what you're asking, not to use the big four letter word that uh, folks may not uh, appreciate, but CASB. So there's a cloud access security broker that is designed as uh, technology uh, that's meant to sit between a user and a cloud provider uh, to detect data breaches uh, and the likes. Uh, and there are different other platforms, Zero Trust, et cetera, that allow you to stay in front of uh, architectural issues. But um, yes, we must all evolve. Uh, it is absolutely the moment AWS created the first virtualized environment that now lives behind most of what we're using right now. You think you're purchasing uh, uh, system access from Zoom, but it's really AWS behind the scenes that's making it possible for us to do exactly what we're doing now. And so the way that particular platform and many, many others uh, continue to evolve, uh, the security platforms, the Cloud Security Alliance, Alliance uh, being one of the largest uh, providers of a common security framework uh, for cloud providers, uh, it exists, but it continues to evolve as well. And so we must all, uh, industry uh, and um, experts alike, must challenge that security framework and get wide adoption Otherwise, the moment we're trusting on the shared responsibilities, that's when uh, the threat vectors get realized. And then those are all the questions that were submitted. We have time for one more, if anyone has one more question. I, li I love that last one, the theoretical <laughs> use of cloud security permissions, like that one was one that you, uh, to write a thesis on and I got 30 <laughs> seconds to answer it. <laughs> I mean, this has, you know, been exciting. Um, definitely, Jenna, I'm glad, you know, you've been here with me on, on today's call. It's always exciting to see uh, the future of, of SU hitting the world. And you just happen to be a fellow track and field uh, person. Congrats to you and all the the men and women who uh, won the uh, recent indoor championships, way to keep that uh, tradition going. Thank you. Someone um, commented about how they hand wrote their application. <laughs> or, or uh, I won't make a funny joke on the year that you may be graduated. Because <laughs> if you actually wrote it, that, that tells me something. Um, and you may have, you know, some people do that these days because it's a personal touch, but it's all good. Um, someone asked, data blockers advisable for their own car? Um, no, I mean, if you bought a car brand new, you're, you're the first user, it's probably okay. 
uh, assuming you see zero miles. But if it's a used car, uh, if it's, you know, again, you, you have to be trusting who's going to touch your vehicle, right? And the only reason I recommend data blockers, no different than if you're on an airplane, you guys plug into these USBs on airplanes. Well, think about it. If I'm in the seat behind you, I have the ability to connect, even though you think the security is best. Uh, we've done some work for some of the largest airlines in the world, and they have challenges too. So yes, you can use it for your personal car, but maybe not for the rentals. And then with that, I want to thank you guys all for attending tonight's event. And thank you, Charles, for speaking to me. Um, April's webinar is Steve Arena from Susquehanna Class of 2011. He's the uh, senior copywriter at WWE, which, a, which is a multifaceted media organization and leader in global entertainment. And he's also a comic book journalist. If you'd like to um, look at more of our alumni speaker series events, it's at www sualum.com and they're also recorded on the SU's YouTube channel um, at, underneath the alumni speaker series. Uh, thank you Charles and everyone have a great evening. Thanks for having me you guys take care.